When I returned to Switzerland, I got uh, an invitation at the University of Zurich and at the ETH um, to introduce computer science as a new subject. And, of course, being uh, a software man, essentially, uh, I looked what tools were available, and that was rather a disappointment. Yes, yes, there was Algol available which uh, convinced me through its rigor and its good structure, uh, but it had a lousy implementation. And I felt uh, using that algol could only reduce the chances of it ever being accepted. And on the other side, there was only Fortran, which I found unsuitable for teaching not to talk about assembler language, assembler code. So I decided to continue my work from Stanford and uh, and implement, no, not another Algol compiler, but what later became known as Pascal. It uh, had been a member of the IFIP working group and there were finally two proposals, one by Art van Weingarten from Amsterdam and one from me. And uh, I might say I lost out. Uh, and then I decided to implement it just in spite of it all, because I needed it. I needed it for teaching. And that's how it led uh, one and a half years later to Pascal, 1969. And in 1971, I used it for the first time in an introductory programming course. It kind of took a life of its own, right? It took a life of its own in the in corporate in the corporate world. I mean, yes, yes. Um, although I must say, it took some time. Um, we had implemented Pascal on quite a lot of different computers. Um, and we had helped other universities who wanted it to transport it to their computers, code where Pascal P, the portable system. Uh, but the real breakthrough came actually with the advent of the microcomputer. Um, Apple II, particularly also Tandy and some others. Um, and they brought out UCSD Pascal and uh, uh, Pascal implementation by B B Borland, Turbo Pascal. And, and they were selling not only compilers, but an integrated system with text editor and uh, debugger for something like $50. And that really made the difference. At the time when compilers would still cost thousands of dollars for the large machines. And now, of course, they spread into the areas where people did not come loaded with bad preconceptions, you know. They started learning programming from scratch. And uh, that's how uh, computing was brought into homes and schools. What other language would have been suitable for the microprocessor revolution in the early days of the microprocessor revolution? Yeah, well, that was, of course, the point, yes. Uh, that, that There was only one competitor that was basic. Uh, but from the pedagogical point of view, I think Pascal was the right thing. But even if you think of it as a systems development language on early microprocessors, the mm -hmm. fact that you had um, real interfaces and type yeah. And, yeah. and the ability to kind of, at, at some level, make contracts... Yeah. Types, then basic, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so basic really wasn't a competitor at all, I think, if you start thinking about doing... Well, for things. beginners' courses it was, of course, yes. and, uh, and particularly in the U.S., 
people were not used to structured languages, you know. Even Fortran was a fairly flat thing. And, um, but Pascal caught on quite well also in primary schools. And, 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 and Pascal was the sort of the API definition for Apple all the way through Macintosh, right? And That's right. Did you interact with UCSD, with Apple, or by then was it simply kind of a public, a public it, good? It, it was public good, yes. Uh, no, I had very little interaction, um, really almost none. Yeah. The, 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 the Atlantic Ocean is too wide, or, or was too wide for close interaction, I think. And uh, we had always distributed our software for free, covering the cost of the tape. Uh, and so, of course, uh, nobody had an obligation to fall back on me. Certainly in the beginning of computing, open source wasn't something we thought of as special or different. It was just a way of behaving. Yes, I yes. Mean, I think universities always behaved like that, open source. I mean, universities have an interest in spreading their ideas, uh, not in protecting them. Uh, talk about the kind of the follow-on languages that you carefully didn't name Pascal. Yes, I did not. And uh, from the commercial point of view, it's regrettable. Because if I had called Modular Pascal 2 and Oberon Pascal 3, they would have had better success. Um, yes, Modular 2 came nine years after Pascal. And it was a language designed for system development, influenced also by MESA, developed at Xerox Park, where I spent the sabbatical. MESA itself based on Pascal. And the primary new feature of Modula was the module. And with it, the interface specification and in the implementation, the separate compilability of modules. Um, separate compilability with tight interface type checking. That's, of course, what was missing in Fortran. And uh, so linking different m modular modules together is as safe as just programming in one module. And that was an absolutely crucial thing. So talk about the transition then from Modula to Oberon. That took place um, after my second sabbatical at Xerox Park, uh, starting 87, 89. Um, I and my colleague Jürg Gutknecht had actually become convinced that the future lay particularly for teaching programming in simpler languages. And Modula, to our taste, had already been overloaded with features and facilities. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to, to clean up Obero, uh, Modula 2, and that resulted in Oberon. We added essentially only one feature, an important one though, that was type extension. And together with together uh, with type extension and together with procedure variables, which were already present in Modular, uh, you could implement full scheme of object orientation. So from the outset, that was the innovation in, in Oberon, simplicity plus object orientation. So Oberon also begat an operating system, correct? Yes. Uh, remember, I had spent my sabbatical, the first one at Xerox, in 76, 77, and I was given uh, an auto computer for myself alone, under my desk. And that was, of course, an absolute change in, in the way computers were used. At home, I still had a terminal linked with a thin wire to a big machine which was, was shared with hundreds of others. And so having my own computer with a bitmap screen, you know, 
able to do much more flexible text editing and fonts and graphics and all that. That was really for me a revelation. And I decided uh, that I wouldn't want to program with these old dinosaurs anymore. And I had to have one of these things too. But they were not on sale. Uh, they couldn't be bought. And uh, the only thing I could do was to decide to build one myself. And that's uh, how I diversified into hardware. Fortunately, I had been trained as an electrical engineer, and so it was a bit easier. But in the meantime, which was something like 15 years, electronics had undergone a big change, you know, from... I was still trained on vacuum tubes, and now they were the not only the transistors, but the integrated chips. But it was really fascinating, and with with very little money, I think I got about 50,000 francs as a starting capital, we built a little workshop and, uh, and, and built prototypes. And, and they were, of course, then tuned to modular. The language modular and the compilers and the operating systems were closely connected to to the Lilith computer, as it was called. And the whole thing was, in a way, repeated ten years later with a pair of Oberon language, Oberon operating system then, and the series computer. I felt that we should apply the same principles of simplicity and well-structuredness that we used in software also to hardware. And this is now possible because it is FPGAs. And so I uh, got a Xilinx development tool with an FPGA on it. I implemented a processor, I call it RISC. But it is much simpler than the ARM or the, the, the MIPS or the Spark. Really, again, concentrating on what's essential and presentable to students. The processor's very low code takes about three pages. And then, and I'm just about finishing this, I wrote an Oberon compiler for that RISC architecture, including compiler and linker and downloader. And so now we start, uh, or I start revising the book, uh, completely rewriting the chapters on the compiler and the linker loader. But the rest remains surprisingly as it was, with relatively few changes, which shows that the ideas there were quite modern. Do you have any FPGAs that are well, grand. yes, this one is it. Unplug it. That's just a, a Xilinx development board which costs about $100. And, and this is your microprocessor? I mean, this is the FPGA right. into which I have uh, downloaded the, yeah. the, risk, the, FPGA. the risk processor. Okay. Yeah. And so when you're finished downloading that, it becomes the microprocessor. That's right, exactly. And yeah. where does memory come from? Oh, it has memory. Yeah. These two chips are one megabyte. So by nowadays standards, it's of course still a small computer, but we can easily fit the whole Oberon operating system. We understand what an FPGA is, and then you're building up. Yeah. Effectively from Gates in right. an open way. Right. And that's, that's, that's the idea for teaching. And in the new version of the book, there will also be a chapter on this. Has to be. To yeah. make it complete.